Hello. This video is all about Stalin's economic policy. So this is covering the period stretching from about 1928 to 1953. And I'm sure, as I'm sure you can see, this board is absolutely packed with stuff. And that's just because when we look at economic history, it's not just enough to know about what happened. It's also really important to understand the statistics. Um, and there's also this additional thing which is important, which is the aims of leaders. And I haven't even written that down, so there's a lot in this lesson. If it ends up being really long, then I might cut it in two, but I'm, I'll probably leave it as one. Stalin, as we know, comes to power in about 1928. Now, notice how I always say about 1928, because we generally say that as the date, but it's not concrete. I feel like it's best to split into industry and agriculture at this point because they both, although they, they share similar themes, um, I think they're different enough to separate. In 1928, the five-year plans begin. Now, when you speak to people about Stalin, they'll normally talk about two things, the purges and the five-year plans. The five-year plans were economic policies which sought to heavily industrialise Russia, uh, or the, the Soviet Union, um, militarise hugely and gave very little concern for consumer goods or living standards or anything like that. It sought to have full employment, 100% employment, 0% unemployment, and generally just economic growth at all costs. Stalin said that when he took power, they were so far behind the Britons of the world, the Germanys of the world, the, uh, the Americas of the world, that they had to industrialise or they would have died as a, as a nation. They would have just uh, ceased to exist. Now, we can generally say this is because Stalin saw, historically, Russia's place in the world as constantly backwards. And so it was necessary at this point to... It's closing my laptop. It's necessary at this point for him to heavily industrialise and bring his country forward into the future. So in the event of an attack from the bourgeois capitalists to his um, to the West, uh, that he would be able to repel the attack. And that's exactly what he tried to do. So the five-year plans start. They involve the... Um, the, uh, the, um, the state takes control of all industry. There is the banning of private industries. And all of the, the economy is set to work at producing stuff like steel, coal, iron, um, electricity, things which can be used to make guns and bullets and tanks and stuff. One of the major things which is attributed to the five-year plans is the Moscow Metro. This was built in 1935 and Stalin saw this as important for two reasons. Number one, it was a prestige thing. There was only one real metro in the world at this point and that was the one we have here in London. The second reason was because transport is very important for a good economy. You need to be able to get workers from one place to the other, and this is exactly what the Moscow Metro did. Uh, workers were gener generally allowed to get on for free, and they could easily get to work and whatnot. There were some huge problems with this five-year plan, though. The first, it, it was because it was all centralised, centrally planned, things were incredibly inefficient. You would have factories build lots of iron, but because they wouldn't be communicated with properly, they would just leave the iron there uh, until it began to rust, right? Uh, the transport links weren't good enough to get things uh, across the country. And let's remember, Russia is a huge country. Um, the the transport, transport links weren't good enough to transport stuff around. There is also this issue of a target-based target, target -based economy. Targets... So the five-year plans were just that. They were just plans. Uh, they didn't tell you how to make lots of stuff. They just told you to make lots of stuff. And guess what? If you didn't make lots of stuff, you'd be thrown into a gulag. It wasn't a matter of a plan in the sense of actually managing managers. It just told managers what they wanted, what, what Stalin needed them to produce. Target-based economies generally don't work. We can see it with teachers, for example. Teachers don't like being given targets. And when you give people targets, they will do anything they can to meet those targets, even if it involves lying, right? 
factory managers would rather lie and say that they met um, whatever target it was rather than saying, well, no, Stalin, look, you're asking either A, for a bit too much, or B, you haven't given us the right equipment to actually make the stuff that you need. This isn't productive at all because, you know, you, you don't get better moving forward, you just have lots of dead factory managers. In order to meet these targets, though, there was something called the Stachnovite movement. This occurred when uh, a, a guy called Alexei Stachnovite, he was a miner, he went out to work one day. This is the propaganda story. He went to work one day and he worked so hard because he, uh, you know, he was keen on the government, the, the dictatorship of the proletariat. He was a good um, Soviet citizen and he produced 14 times what is expected of a miner in a single shift. What they didn't tell you was that Stachnovite had the, uh, had the help with uh, the best equipment available. He also had lots of helpers, which just kind of makes the whole thing a lie. Another such example of this kind of Soviet propaganda was um, when they produced the AK-47. Um, there is this story of lots of scientists going and working in a lab to get this perfect gun. Uh, that's not really how it worked. Um, but of course, you know, it's much easier to place a scientist on a pedestal and say he was the, um, he was the citizen who made this excellent rifle and let's all try and be like him. So that was their answer to productivity. Uh, generally, it, it worked quite well because you would have stacked and bright workers who were given a badge or whatever, and they also would have been given extra benefits on the work, uh, uh, in, in the workplace. There was very few consumer goods. As we alluded to earlier, Stalin didn't actually care about consumer goods because Someone's shouting at their kid outside. Great. Um, the yeah, so the the um, there is no no need for him to create consumer goods. Quite frankly, if there's less consumer goods, they might die quicker, and then there's less people to feed and clothe. At least that's how Stalin thinks. So as I said, forty percent of stuff was all wasted. Forty percent of everything produced was wasted. It was not produced into anything further. Stuff like uh, iron and, and coal and whatever. Um, between 1936 and 1940 though, electricity production went up by 51% and so and oil went up by 25%. So I know I've been quite negative about the five-year plans, but in terms of raw output, stuff did go up massively. Especially when you consider that prior to 19... Well, I mean, prior to the five-year plans, this was a really weak economy. Uh, feudal in, in some sense. Uh, which had been hit very hard by the First World War. So stuff like coal, steel, iron went up massively. And this was what Stalin was really happy about. Going back to the objective of militarisation, well, he did militarise. He militarised incredibly well. And when the Germans did attack in 1941, he was ready for them. Moving on to agriculture. We have emergency measures in 1928. Stalin said, look, stop, everyone stop, stop. The NEP is done, enough. The reason it's done is because we've got these kulaks. Kulaks are rich farmers, and this is what they're doing. They're producing less grain to push up prices. And in fact, they're hiding grain and they're causing food shortages. And these evil kulaks must be rounded up and killed or sent to the gulags. And he wasn't wrong because that was something that was happening among, among farmers. Uh, if you look at the simple laws of su supply and demand, if the price for something is low, you just withhold supply and it goes up. Uh, this was awful for the economy, though, because when you have um, an economy which is heavily centralised like this, if there are private contractors and they're pushing prices up, this really hurts the government, as we didn't want any of this. There's also ideological reasons for this, too. Um, Stalin believed that... Uh, Stalin's often shown as a pragmatist, but... I do think that collectivization was, on some level, an ideological goal for him. He needed to show he was being bigger than Lenin. He was going closer to the goal of communism. And he also saw that he could pick up lots of supporters on the left of the party. So, having ousted Trotsky and all the rest of them, he saw that there were lots of supporters who could potentially um, make him much stronger. And so moving to the left economically was something which enhanced his power base. 
So emergency measures ends the NEP, it, begin, it begins grain requisitioning again. And by 1929, you have the start of collectivization, which was the act of saying to farmers, look, you don't own your farm anymore, we own your farm. And also, you don't just, you're not just in charge of your farm anymore. We're going to smush lots of farms together to create these massive farms. The reason for this is because of a concept called economies of scale. And I guess it kind of goes like this. If me and you have two competing businesses, let's, let's get rid of the left-wing economics for a second. Let's talk about, in our current economy, in the British economy, let's say you and I both create bags. We both create satchels, right? And we both, because of our respective demands, we both create 50 satchels each. If you and I decided to say, look, let's stop competing and combine our firms, right? We could create 100 satchels collectively. What does that do? Well, that means we can buy things for less because we're buying in bulk. We can invest more in technology because we're producing more things. And overall, it just makes it a much more efficient, oppor uh, uh, efficient operation. And that was the idea with collective farms. If you had this larger scale operation, you'd make much more savings um, and things would go a lot smoother. This was also helped by Stalin's de decision and his real passion for getting tractors onto the fields. There are lots of paintings of Stalin standing in front of fields and you've got tractors going around in the background. And this was because he saw the real need to uh, modernize Russians agri Russia's agriculture. Uh, people were still going around with oxes and carts and stuff and that wasn't his vision for Russia. However, when the party members, because they generally were party members, when they went into the uh, rural heartlands of uh, Russia, they were met with extreme opposition in terms of uh, they were being killed and uh, just generally met with um, no love whatsoever. And also, once it got to the point where the party um, or the state even was just beginning to take control of these collective farms, the farmers would rather, and in fact they did, um, just kill their animals and set fire to their houses and stuff because they thought, uh, if I can't have it, no one can. And that was their way of protesting. This was in some part because they were deeply religious in the, uh, uh, on farms and stuff. And religion was generally uh, in opposition to communism because of the conflicting ideologies. So they were generally associated with being uh, heathens and uh, you know blasphemers or whatever uh, the communist that is. So 17 million horses were killed by their owners, and so were 26 million cattle. This isn't good for the economy. When people just decide to start killing all of your country's assets, it's not good at all. Uh, Stalin's rather brutal way of dealing with this is he not only stole their grain, but he just didn't give any to any of them. Uh, he kept them in big storerooms and let lots of people starve to death. In Ukraine, some five million people died over the course of two years. As a result, agri agricultural production just plummeted. It went from, um, but between 1928 and 1934, it went down by 5.7 million tons and by the first uh, sorry by the second world war uh, agriculture is in a pretty sorry state it's beginning to recover but the, the this agricultural policy was um awful it was like poison really to the good work done by the nep uh, in the sense of increasing agricultural production in his attempts to get rid of the kulaks while stalin succeeded and he failed he succeeded in the sense that he killed most of uh, or a lot of the people who worked on farms anyway kulak or otherwise but he failed because he was he found it very difficult to actually identify kulaks uh, when you went into these villages you didn't have kulaks and uh, normal farmers you just had a village and so it wasn't easy to identify them and as a result you had this antagonistic relationship between uh, the farmers and the state. World War II comes along, Stalin is ready for it. Uh, there's not really much to talk about economically. They did exactly the same thing as every other country does during the Second World War. 
they collectivize, uh, sorry, they centralize everything. They spend all of their budget on producing bullets and stuff, and they win the war. 25 million people are homeless following the Second World War. This is the problem. Stalin doesn't care much, though. He doesn't actually bother to start rehousing these people. Instead, much of the work goes on getting the farms and getting the factories back in order. The four or five year plan managed to exceed pre-war highs. It did incredibly well. And that was largely because the factories weren't hit that hard by the Second World War anyway. The farms, on the other hand, were absolutely decimated. If you think of uh, how the Second World War worked, uh, the, the, uh, the Nazis went through Ukraine and um, through Poland and just absolutely took the, the western side uh, of the USSR over and they just destroyed lots of the stuff that was there. So it was much harder to get um, agriculture back and running, up and running. And even by 1952, they were still two, uh, two million tons lower than they were before uh, the, the Second World War started. Military production stayed at about a quarter of government spending. Now, you might think, well, why did that happen? They just won the Second World War. They could probably rest for a little while in terms of spending all their money on uh, the military. Well, this is when the Cold War starts. Stalin knew that he was likely to be at odds with the Americans for a very long time, and he knew this fairly quickly. He could really see this happening in 1946 to 47, and so it made sense in his head to keep up the high military spending. Of course, this didn't really do much for anyone other than himself. Uh, consumer goods did get a boost in the fourth year, fi fourth five year plan, but only to 12% of government spending. And when you think that's not really that much, um, I guess that's all there, all there really is to say for economics post World War Two. During the Second World War, there were some private farms allowed to operate, just because. If you're fighting a war, it doesn't really matter that much where you're getting your grain from, as long as you're getting it. And so Stalin kept his, uh, like, let some private farms operate. By 1950, this was totally done. There was no more private farms. They just got rid of them. There, was, there were a few, but um, overwhelmingly it was all collectives and state-owned farms. Finally, we can look at some of the changes that, that, that took place not only within this period, but between Lenin and Stalin. The biggest one, and the one I would expect most people to write about in their exams, is the end of the new economic policy. In both industry and agriculture, there was, under Lenin, particularly after the Civil War, um, some form of market liberalisation, right? It wasn't totally state-owned, but this was entirely overturned by Stalin. Stalin saw that the NEP wasn't working by 1928 and decided just to completely overhaul it. And, you know, these are the results, you can judge them for better or worse. This is now totally a command economy. Those of you who aren't familiar with economic terms, this means that overwhelmingly every, all of the assets, all of the, the economic activity in this country is done by the state. Uh, this is in stark contrast to the free market economy, well, it's not totally free market, but the the market which leads towards free market economics in the form of America post World War II. And this is what you actually have, right? So you have this powerhouse in the form of the USA post World War II, and you have this, this other powerhouse in the form of the USSR. And they both have these conflicting economic interests. And that really, it paved the way for much of the developments which happened in the second half of the 20th century. Continued high military spending, as I said, they didn't decide to uh, cut military spending after the Second World War. And in fact, military spending has been really quite constant through uh, this period. It wasn't so high under Lenin, and that was because he didn't really see the Second World War coming. Stalin was incredibly paranoid and so he anticipated some sort of conflict. Finally, one thing which has been constant up until this point, even under Lenin, 
has been a low level of consumer goods. You had in some places in Moscow, you had shop queues stretching over a thousand people, right? There simply wasn't enough things for people to have. And you can understand why this was when you look at Stalin's Russia as a totalitarian regime. He didn't have to win votes. He didn't have to get people to like him. They were just too scared of him to protest this lack of consumer goods. And unless Stalin had woken up one day and ideologically decided that he needed to give more consumer goods, there was no practical need and Stalin at his core was a pragmatist. This was an economic system which worked for Stalin but it didn't really work for anyone else. It worked for Stalin in the sense that it got his targets more or less met. It helped him militarise, but for the rest of Russia this was an awful time economically. It was a time of famine, uh, it was a time where poverty continued to increase, and it was really a time where US, the, the USSR and the economic identity of, of the country began to emerge as one which didn't really care about its people. The reason I'm, I'm talking about this kind of stuff is because when we look at Khrushchev's economic policies in the next video in this series, we see him as a leader responding to the problems caused by this economic policy. And I believe it is this economic policy and Khrushchev's which, uh, when looked at side by side, gives the most insight into the way the Soviet Union was run. Please like the video if you liked it. Feel free to dislike it if you disliked it. And subscribe if you want to see more of my content. I hope to see you again next time.